Hello everyone, my name is DJ Matias. I'm a creative specialist here at Foundry. In the following segments, we'll hear from a few different people covering the basis of what machine learning is and how the machine learning copycat tool in NukeX works. The machine learning process relies heavily on the GPU for the accelerated training of models. So if you plan on doing a lot of machine learning, then we would recommend that you have the beefiest NVIDIA graphics card that you can get your hands on especially if you want to be able to train models as fast as possible. To give us a quick high-level overview about machine learning and AI, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Terry Ryasat. Terry is Foundry's Head of Creative Services for the Americas. Take it away, Terry. In this video, I'm going to give you an introduction to machine learning inside of Nuke. To start off, I'm going to explain a general concept of what machine learning is before going into how it can be used to improve your workflows in Nuke. You hear the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning quite a bit, so let's take a look at a simple explanation. Artificial intelligence, or AI, refers to a simulation of a human's intelligence in machines. The term AI can be applied to any machine that has characteristics associated with the human mind. Now this can range from learning, to reasoning, to perception. AI can train programs for a specific task and allow it to probe and improve on its own. Machine learning is an application or a subset of AI. It's the science of having computers act without rule-based programming and can learn and improve from experience. It finds patterns in data and then makes predictions of what the results should be. There are different methods in machine learning. Let's focus on the two main ones. Supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is done by providing a ground truth. With this method, we have a desired outcome that's needed, and we can also add weight to an input that will decide how much influence it will have on the output. We will use these truths to create a model. Our goal will be to have a function that when given data and knowing what our desired output should be, return something predictable. With unsupervised learning, we only have input data and no corresponding output or ground truth. We are not telling the model what to learn, but want it to find patterns and draw its own conclusion. Machine learning is currently being used in the visual effects and 3D industry for specific tasks. It's helping create natural face expressions on CG characters. It's used for various steps in motion capture workflows. So how will machine learning help you in Nuke? But you can speed up your workflow when you have multiple shots that require the same task. It can help you with tedious tasks that are time consuming like garbage matting, beauty work, cleanup. With Nuke's machine learning workflow, you can use the copycat node for these tasks. In compositing, we always have a desired result, so we provide Nuke's copycat node with the ground truth. We can then train the node knowing what we want for the output. There is no limit to what effects copycat can be used for. The pre-trained deblur and upscale nodes are great examples of results you might want to produce. Think about how long certain tasks would take and how machine learning in Nuke will save you time and effort. Artists are at the center of the machine learning tools inside of Nuke. The artist contributes to the quality of the result. They also create and share data sets. Artists can create their own effects and are not limited to the effects already inside of Nuke. With the Nuke's copycat node, the possibilities are endless. Thank you, Terry, for those great infographics and conveying the information in an easy to follow format. Next up, I'd like to invite Ben Kent onto the stage. Ben will tell us a little bit about how machine learning and AI has been implemented into Nuke and Nuke X, as well as show us some practical uses for machine learning in the VFX industry. Over to you, Ben. Hello there, my name is Ben Kent. I'm the Research Engineering Manager and AI Research Team Lead at Foundry. I think it's fair to say that Nuke is ubiquitous in the VFX industry. If you've seen a film or TV show with visual effects in it, chances are Nuke's been used on it. Now, all that being said, the one thing that Nuke didn't have until recently was a machine learning tool set. So we created the AI Research Team with the goal of changing that. At the top, we can see an upscale effect or super resolution, you might see it called, where we take a low resolution image and turn it into a high resolution image, recreating all the high frequency details and sharp edges. 
Machine learning is amazing at this, like much better than any traditional algorithm I've ever seen. Next up, we have an example of depth estimation, where a network predicts the depth of every pixel in an image, which is really useful for VFX for a whole host of reasons, such as depth of field effects, adding in environmental effects like fog. Final pair of images we've got show an effect called content aware fill, where the network cleverly fills in an area of an image using awareness of the surrounding pixels. Copycat's a new plugin where an artist trains their own neural network specific to the shot or set of shots they're working on. So what it does is not predefined. It's not pre-trained and it's definitely not generic. It doesn't require huge data sets. The artist gives Copycat just a small set of before and after images for whatever effect they've decided to produce. They hit the start training button and Copycat learns to replicate the transformation from one to another. This exports a cat file, which contains the network weights, which they can then load up in the inference node where they can apply the train network to the rest of the sequence or even multiple similar sequences, potentially even across whole shows. Imagine you've got a whole TV series and using Copycat, you can tailor an effect to work just on the lead actor who appears over and over again in hundreds of shots. Like, how cool is that? And like I say, what it can do hasn't been defined by us, the developers. It can do any image to image effect that an artist chooses to do. As we like to say, we're putting machine learning into the hands of the artist's imagination. So let me show you some more examples of what it can do. For this one, we've got some beauty work or cleanup. We wanted to remove the bruise from this actor's face. So we painted out by hand in just two frames, let it train, and then we've applied the network to remove the bruise in the entire rest of the sequence. Next up is a beard removal example. So here we have Foundry's own version of Henry Cavill. Similar approach again, we painted out the beard by hand in, if I remember correctly, 11 frames and then applied it to the whole shot, which is hundreds of frames long. That would be pretty time consuming to do entirely manually. Seven months to grow that beard. Copycat, we erased it in a matter of hours. Finally, we've got a masking example. If you look at the goat, she's also wearing a set of headphones and it's unlikely any pre-trained effect would pick up on that. So you'd still have to go through and do a load of manual rotoscoping. But with Copycat, the artist's telling the network exactly what they want it to do. But this new approach comes with some all new challenges. So if you want to deploy an inference only network, there are some good, well-established inference engines. They're lightweight, fast, memory efficient, cross-platform, well-tested. However, machine learning frameworks you can train on, such as TensorFlow and PyTorch, well, they're fantastic for developers who can set up an environment or Docker container download the exact version for their hardware and OS that don't mind the size, but they're not really created with deployment in mind. They're large, they tend not to be as kind on GPU memory, and really they're just not developed to be bundled with an application and run on unknown hardware. So finding one that fulfilled all our needs with the required level of stability was definitely a challenge. Uh, we ended up settling on PyTorch. The frameworks are also fairly bleeding edge. I mean, new versions are coming out every few months which is fantastic but if you want to keep up to date there's a large amount of overhead and there's also a level of risk relying on something that's quite that new. On top of that we needed to make the tools easy to use. I mean sure VFX artists are tech savvy but that doesn't mean they're all machine learning wizards and an artist doesn't want to have to do a master's in linear algebra to use a plugin and they probably don't want to know all the details of learning rate decay and atom optimizers. So boiling all that obscure stuff down to a tool that's artist friendly was an important challenge to overcome. And finally, as I'm sure you all know, machine learning training can sometimes be a little on the unpredictable side. Sometimes I kind of feel like it's as much an art form as a science. And the results are dependent on the data, the network architecture, the hyperparameters, there are quite literally millions of variables at play. So how do you support that? Well, Foundry's wonderful content teams currently producing a whole host of tutorials 
and we'll continue to do that as we learn more ourselves about the wonder that is machine learning for VFX. Thank you, Ben. Definitely some great information and examples of machine learning in Nuke and Nuke X. Next up, it's my pleasure to welcome Mads Hagbarth Damsbo, as he will share with us some of the innovative functionality in machine learning using the copycat tool in Nuke X. So let's see what you have for us today, Mads. Manipulating faces is one of those very tricky aspects of compositing. It's something that I find extremely fascinating and I absolutely love to work with. And so that was one of the things that I really wanted to dive into when I started using the copycat node. It's easy to get some input A to represent some ground truth B, like having a completely random input and training that on a series of faces. But you want to be able to control the system and have some kind of relationship between the data you input and the ground truth. Not only to make the training easier and better, but also leave room for artist interaction. So one of the first things I did was to create a representation mainly using paint strokes that will represent different key facial features, and then using the Nuke Smart Vectors to drive those. And so by providing a single still frame as a texture and then animating the strokes, I was able to drive the animation of the face based on that single still image. Each stroke had a unique color to represent an ID. I also tried just having small dots with a unique unpremultiplied alpha value, but that didn't necessarily work as well. And later, I tried replacing the strokes with a spline warp and an ST map to fill in the gaps between these features. But there were a few issues with this approach. First of all, you need to be consistent with the way that you place the markers. Secondly, you need to adhere to the topology and the sort of constraint relationship between the points of the face. Like if you move the jaw down, you most likely want to take the bottom part of the lips with it. And lastly, there is this spatial relationship with the cropping size and how I use a single still to define the texture of the face. When you do your training, the crop size sort of defines how far away you can be from the original origin. So if I had a crop size of 256 during my training, you can think that there is like a 256 pixel constraint radius around each point. And as soon as I move the point outside of this area, it will no longer be able to read the data of the face texture. So what I needed was some kind of template that would allow me to set the points easily and add sort of a natural human facial constraints to the points. And rather than providing a texture, let the model cat file carry the texture of the face. And so at this point, I realized that it would probably be easier to just have a 3D model representing the face. And so for this, I decided to use the Keen Tools Face Builder and Face Tracker. The first thing I wanted to do was to test the temporal stability of this setup. So I provided a few images of me as an input and the normals of the 3D match move face as the ground truth. And even with just a handful of training images, the output was fairly stable. This could be used for some creative masking or fake relighting or whatever. Now it's time to do it the other way around, giving the UVs of the 3D match move face as an input and my face as a ground truth. While normals are just a soft gradient, and I guess that's why it didn't require too many images, facial texture is much more defined. And so for this training, I needed a few hundred images to get a good result. Once training was complete, I could generate a face from the UVs of the face tracker tool. And using the pin tool, I can control the facial features easily. Now, one of the cool things about this Keen tool setup is that the model transformation and the model disformation is handled separately. This means that I can control the dialog of the face independently from the general actor performance. So now I can pick the perfect dialog take with the perfect performance take. And I guess we've all been in the situation where the story beats of a film of a TV series have changed or certain important details of the story needs to be emphasized, usually with off-screen dialogue or something crazy like that. Well, now we can take the dialogue from a dubbing performance that we record six months after the shoot and transfer that dialogue onto the old plate. Sort of a digital dubbing, 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 dubbing. Oh, well, looks like we lost signal with Mads, but amazing work as always, Mads. Thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. For those of you wanting to see more of Mads' inspiring creations, he can be found at hagbarth.net or hygx.net, and you can even follow him on Twitter at xads. Now that we've seen some examples of how machine learning can be used, in this final segment, we'll take a look at how to set up a nuke script for machine learning as well as show the pre-trained models that are already included in Nuke. Here with the copycat node in Nuke X, basically we've set it up. We have our data set of our ground truth and input images. 
For every ground truth, we need to have a corresponding input image. So it's like our before and after results, telling the machine what we want it to look like after. We dive into our group here of our beauty fix. We can see all the work that was done, clean up that bruise on the actor's face. All this is going to be processed through the training. What we're going to do is then take our copycat node and plug in the inputs, ground truth to the ground truth, and then the input to the input. We're using a pen clip node here to create a sequence out of these non-consecutive frames here. We'll look at the copycat properties. Basically we want to define a location of where we want to save our training files to. Under the advanced tab, we have a few options. Here at the epochs, this is going to be the number of times it's going to analyze the data set. We'll adjust that. You see our total steps now comes to 40,000 as well. Here we have the ability to choose which model size we want as a result. It's a large one being a little bit longer to process, but better quality and smaller being faster to process, but not as high quality as the large and medium right there in between. We can set our contact sheet intervals. Uh, the contact sheets are basically going to show us a grid of our ground truth image, our input image, and our output image. And when we first train, start training, we'll see that the contact sheet, the output doesn't look anything like the ground truth, as you can see there in the bottom left corner of the viewer. But over time, this output will begin to match the ground truth image. This is a good way to monitor your training session. Another way is by using the graph here. It's a good idea to keep an eye on the training because you don't want to spend too much time training only to find out that you're not getting the results at the end that you expect. So this graph should basically start off high, drop down low and begin to flatten off at the bottom there. That'd be an indication of a good training session or successful. If for any reason you see any spiking within that graph, then that might be an instance where you want to adjust either the settings here on the properties panel or add in additional reference images. And once this is done training, we have the option to create an inference node right here through the properties panel. Click that and load in the latest training file from that training session. You can now take that model you just trained and infer it upon the original source with which it was trained or apply it to a similar source. So this one is the original source. We can see before and after. We use those two frames as reference. We play through this, see nice clean results all the way through just based off of those two frames of work that we had to do rather than the entire sequence of 340 frames. So do a really nice job. Here, once again, we're taking that inference node. We're going to infer that previously trained model onto this new shot. Same actor, new shot. Now what we want to do is take a look and see how well it applies to the shot. It may or may not work specifically well for the shot. Uh, not a problem because what we can do is just add in a couple more reference frames just for this particular shot. And we can already use that training information by using a checkpoint. So we're going to load in a checkpoint or start, in, start this training with a checkpoint from our previously trained model. So this really gives us a foundation of information already. So when you see we start training with this one, uh, you'll notice that the output matches the ground truth a lot closer from the beginning. Let's start that training and the contact sheet will pop up there in the left side corner. You can see now that the output definitely matches the ground truth a lot closer just because we have an initial weights that we already loaded in there from our previous training session. So it's going to move a lot quicker for us get cleaner results. Now that that's trained for that particular shot, great. We now have a training model for that that can then be applied to other similar shots and begin adding upon that uh, library of the, or that model training session. Now when it comes to using our other AI nodes that are included inside of Nuke, such as Upscale, it's a lot simpler to use basically because it's already been trained for you. We had that information uh, the node itself will just apply it to whatever source you want to bring in. So this instance here, we're looking at on the left, a 540 source, and it's being upscaled two times to a 1080. And you can see all of that information in detail 
that's coming back in with that upscale node. So this is comparing it to the TVI scale on the left. And you can see that even with the TVI scale, we're even getting better results with that upscaler. The upscale node is GPU accelerated, so that way it'll run a little bit faster than the TVI scale. The other one that we brought into Nuke, uh, our AI node, is the Deblur node. So once again, you don't have to do anything other than just call in the Deblur node and apply it to your footage because this is an already pre-trained node with information. So if you have motion blur like this, you can want to try to clean that up, add the Deblur node on there, and it'll eliminate some of that motion blur. Any defocusing, maybe you have a shot that was defocused slightly, you want to get a nice crisp and sharp. Another instance for the Deblur node. So hopefully this presentation has shed some light on not only the obvious benefits of machine learning in Nuke X, but it's also sparked some inspiration on how you might be able to take advantage of the copycat tool to create visual effects for your next show. Thank you all so very much for your attention and continued support of Foundry products. Until next time.